but it was a long developmental process, and I, I, I was surprised when I was trying to define some historical stuff, how long ago this, this process began. So in 1990, um, a physician at UC Berkeley discovers this little immune system break, CTLA-4. In 1998, uh, this uh, intellectual property is licensed to a company called Nexstar. This is then, they look, start looking at different uh, molecules to attack this, this break on the immune system. And it's not until though a couple of hands are changed that a company named Metarex finally develops at Belumimab. And in 2005, BMS and Metarex joined to commercially develop at Belumimab. So you see that the, the idea was 1990, and um, the implementation has only been actually fairly recently. And the trials are now coming out, obviously, and, and this is where we're reaping the benefits. So again, I, I don't want to show a lot of trials, but there are just two really important trials that we have now for ipilimumab. So this is for patients who've already had a line of chemotherapy. And for us in Canada, this is a drug called DTIC. So these patients have either failed or progressed right away on these, this, this old chemotherapy and are allowed to enroll in this trial, which is the new drug ipilimumab. Uh, and uh, versus basically a placebo. You'll see this word GP100. This is a sort of a vaccine type of thing. It's, it, it probably is not very relevant, but the, the gist of the trial, it's a placebo versus ipilimumab. And we had nothing else to try in patients. Not to say people were not trying things in this setting, but they were doing so without any evidence of benefit. Sort of the, you know, reaching into their black cauldron and pulling out some sort of combination and hence it didn't work very often. So we accrued, uh, patients uh, were accrued from about four years, 13 countries, and you had to have metastatic um, disease. And patients were given um, ipilimumab, uh, four doses, and they were allowed uh, to be re-inducted, meaning if the medication worked and it came back, the disease, they were allowed to have the medication again. So, <clears throat> And, and whenever you see curves that are not quite lying on top of each other, that's a good thing. So this little space right in between these two curves is what we strive for when we're doing clinical trials. So what we know is now that in this, in, for patients that have had chemotherapy, ipilimumab pro improves their survival. And it does so quite significantly. So if you look at the median overall survival, um, it doesn't do the, what I'll tell you next is going to be more impressive, but median means sort of an average survival if you had ipilimumab was 10 months versus if you had the placebo over here was 6.4 months. But approximately 25% of patients lived over three years, which is almost unheard of for these types of trials. So the other thing that's interesting is, is when we looked at the trial, there was talk of about response rate. Well. Um, the response rate to ipilimumab was not very high. It was only about 10%, but this is a very funny drug, and this is one of the things we're going to have to learn. It's a new tool. And so this is a CT looking at a patient who has uh, metastatic melanoma exposed to ipilimumab. So first of all, after being treated, they start to progress, and then they can start to regress, and then they can continue to regress. We don't see this with chemotherapy. I'll show you another picture. This is someone who, when they started their treatment, um, had the ipilimumab, and they see swelling and progression initially, and then eventual resolution of the lesion. Uh, this does not happen for everyone, but this is one of the reasons why perhaps this drug doesn't look like it causes a lot of responses in patients, is because if you biopsy this thing at week 12, it's all immune cells. There's not a lot of cancer left. So because the immune system is rushed to the area and is attacking these things and gives it the appearance of enlarging in size. And, and so again, this is a new tool. Chemotherapy, this doesn't happen. You know, Old-fashioned chemo, you hit it, you whack it, it shrinks or it doesn't. If it grows, it's not working. So another thing that we, we also saw for those patients that responded well to ipilimumab or had any sort of response of that 10%, this is their survival, and this is now out to 31 months. So if you had a response, you had about a 60 to 70% chance of living about three years. And this isn't drawn from the same trial, but it's, it's still um, uh, one of the other trials with the ipilimumab. And so we know that if you do have a response, it very much means that you're likely to live uh, a whole lot longer than what we see the dismal averages of 10 months. Um, but it's a funny drug again. So the side effects it causes are basically autoimmune. 
So if you've ever heard of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you can get that, essentially, or the equivalent to it with ipilimumab. Rash, endocrinopathies, meaning you can become hypothyroid, let's say, and you can have inflammation of the liver. Uh, but interestingly, the people that had an autoimmune event appeared to do better. So this is something we're going to keep on observing and teasing out, but if you have an IRAE, immune-related adverse event, you did significantly better than a person who did not. Makes sense. That person's immune system was cranked up in a sense. The other person's, maybe the ipilimumab, did not accomplish that as well. So an interesting drug where we see more side effects could mean that you'll do better. Doesn't mean you have to have side effects to respond, but it's, again, it shows how these drugs are different.